Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for this webinar on what to consider as you reopen your business. Uh, we thought this was a timely subject to cover now as some regions in New York State are starting to reopen. Um, and we have our consulting core member, Alec Marfisi, the owner and founder of Upland Strategies here today to talk about what you should be considering as you begin to reopen your business. Um, just some housekeeping here. We will be taking some questions at the end of the session. You'll be able to submit them in the questions module um, on the GoToWebinar toolbar. So please feel free to send those in as the presentation goes on and we will get to as many as we can at the end. Um, so without further ado, I will hand it over to our presenter today, Alec Marfisi. Uh, thanks so much, Brian. This is um, this is the second of uh, the webinars that I've had a chance to do related to uh, COVID-19. And um, it's been so fast paced. It's, it's hard to believe that the last one was only maybe 45, 50 days ago uh, and how much has already changed since then. Um, so the purpose of this, this webinar is going to be to give uh, you folks as business owners, just a few things to consider um, when operating your business in the new reality, the new world, as things start to open up and uh, once eventually everything is reopened. So uh, we can't predict, we can't predict the future, but um, what we can do is look at a few of the data points that have already come out. Uh, big news in the last couple of weeks is the uh, change in the employment rate in the United States. Um, but something that directly affects um, you business owners is consumer spending. So in the U.S., consumer spending makes up more of the economy than really most of the other components um, that go into our GDP. And that's unique about the US. So since the crisis, consumer spending has declined over 30%. And it's very unlikely that it's gonna bounce straight back at the same speed that it fell. Uh, it's gonna take time, because first, uh, there's gonna be a staggered reopening of the states. And then second, people just aren't going to spend at the same speed as they did in the past, um, because, these long-term effects of not having sources of income will filter out through the economy and uh, result in people spending less of their money and, and saving more or not having the money to spend. Uh, U.S. government spending, which is another huge part of our economy, uh, has grown by 9.1% since the beginning of this crisis. Most of that has been related to direct measures uh, pertaining to recovery programs, the underlying uh, government spending on everything else that it takes to run a country uh, hasn't had much of a registered change yet, uh, but it could really go either way. Uh, more specifically to New York State, uh, you know, so New York is planning to open in four phases, and then the regions themselves were also open up in phases, um, you know, with with hospitality companies coming near the end of those of those phases. Uh, so with consumer government and business spending, uh, they're likely to recover less than half as fast as they have fallen in the last 60 days. So the question is, all of this is, is fine to know, but what, what do we do about it? So consumer spending, let's really focus in on that one. Lower consumer spending, means there are lots of options for fewer buyers. So when a crisis like this hits, all of the same players that were out there selling to consumers when times were good are still out there. They're slowly, unfortunately, shutting down. Um, but there are now a lot fewer buyers of their products available. So this is you know, also known as a buyer's market. What that means is the buyer has more control over purchase decisions than the seller does, and price matters a lot more. So people are less likely to overspend on discretionary items. So there's staples and discretionaries, and discretionary items that are things that aren't absolutely critical to survival, like housing, food, and water. So people are gonna be much more price conscientious in the near future. 
And for you as a business owner, you need to know how much you can cut prices, but also the way to be able to do it in a smart, smart manner so that when the economy starts to recover, you're not stuck with lower prices permanently. That doesn't become the new normal and that doesn't become how your customer sees you. You know, now you're, they, we, you don't want your company to be seen as discounted from the value proposition you were giving in the past. So a couple key tips that we, we recommend for you is as you contemplate reducing your prices so that you can satisfy the new levels of demand from consumers, try to scale down your offerings in a smart way with it. So, you know, if you're if you're in the food and beverage world, that could mean portions, literally, literally offering um, you know different portion sizes or trying to think about sides or add-ons and ways in which those can be scaled down. But you know, outside of food and beverage, think about all of the products and services you're offering and try to itemize every single one of their features, right? So everything that goes into a product, every single attribute that is a selling point to your customers, think of each of those things separately. So what goes into your service, what goes into your product, and try to separate them out or price them out. And you can scale down your offerings by making those things add-ons. So if somebody still wants to pay for all of the things that go into your product or service, they can pay the full price, but you now can offer scaled down versions of it. Some products and services this works, some of them they won't work, but it's just one, one option to consider. Um, and then second is if you are going to offer discounts, try to do it in a way that rewards loyalty. So for your returning customers, offer discounts to them. Right? You want to be able to generate repeat business in a world where you're selling at a lower price. The only way to maintain the level of business that you're operating at if you're selling at a lower price is to be able to grow your volume. So you want to incentivize that by offering discounts specifically to return customers. And this also helps you to uh, maintain a higher average price on the whole for your company. So these are some of the more conceptual um, higher end things to consider. We're also going to dig into a little bit about um, figuring out what, what the actual impact these changes will have on your company. So we can do that by doing a break-even calculation, or otherwise known as a contribution margin calculation. So you may have heard of gross profit in terms of your revenue minus your cost of goods sold. Now we're going to factor in labor costs to determine what's known as contribution margin. And the reason we want to do that is because we're going to be able to figure out how many units we need to sell in any period of time. And by knowing that and by being able to figure out that calculation, we'll be able to forecast how much more we need to sell if we lower our prices. Can we afford to lower our prices? Is it feasible for us to sell that many more of our products or services to make up the difference from lower prices? So what we're going to do is choose a normal month for our business. So a normal meaning before coronavirus. Calculate, calculate labor as a percentage of sales. Calculate cost of goods sold as a percentage of sales. And then we'll apply the result to this to our average sale. So let's take a look. So September 2019, way before the crisis started, this fictional company had $50,000 in sales. $15,000 in labor and $14,000 of cost of goods sold in that month. So labor is 30% of sales. And what we mean is 15,000 is 30% of 50,000. Cost of goods sold is 28% of sales. 14,000 is 28% of 50,000. So 30% plus 28% is 58%. That's our new total cost per sale that's factoring in labor cost. So if you're a contractor, you may already be doing this, but for a lot of retail, wholesale, and service companies, you're not doing this type of analysis, and this is gonna help you to figure out how you're gonna be able to contend with changes to your prices as a result of this crisis. So this cost per sale, this 58%, that's based upon how this business was doing in a month. But we can break that down to a single sale 
So it could be to a single unit or it could be to a single transaction, what one customer pays. So if the cost per sale is 58%, your margin or what you make per sale is 42%, right? Because 100% minus 58% is 42%. So to figure out that break even volume, you're going to take all your operating expenses and divide it by this margin right here. So in this fictional company, if each sale is $100 and the business has $16,000 in other expenses each month, its break even volume is going to be $100 times 42%, which is $42 contribution margin. And then that $16,000 divided by $42 is 381 sales of about $100 each per month in order to break even. So that's great, but what do we do with this piece of information? Well, now we can start to play around with it and see, well, as a result of the coronavirus, we're gonna to need to lower our prices by 10%. So what is that going to do to our break-even volume? And why do I wanna know this? So maybe I can do 381 sales per month, but if that goes up to 500 sales per month to break even, I'm gonna break my back. I'm not gonna be able to do it and it's not gonna be feasible for my company. So that's the reason that we're calculating the number of sales, the number of transactions, the volume per month to see if it's feasible for us to do these price changes. So if we lower our price by 10%, that means that each sale is $90, right? And now, you know, how do we, if assuming everything else is staying the same, now that $90 and the cost per sale of $58 per transaction, now there's only a contribution margin of $32 to work with. So now you need to sell 500 or do 500 transactions per month in order to break even. So just by lowering uh, prices by 10%, we've already pushed the number of sales per month we need to do up to 500. And that's something for you to look at and say, yeah, that's something that we can handle. We can handle doing that many transactions per month. Maybe we have enough of a customer base to do that or know that that amount of discount is too much for our business to handle. And you have to start exploring alternatives. So just a a really basic tool for you to use to try to figure out what sort of discounts you can offer to deal with changes in consumer spending. So moving on from consumer spending, business and government spending is the rest of the economy and many, many entrepreneurs like yourselves deal with business and government spending to make the income that runs your business. So as we showed before, business spending or government spending has gone up, but not in every sector. It's really been focused in on these disaster recovery programs. Uh, so infrastructure and social services, a lot of these programs are actually being sidelined right now because government agencies are so busy putting together programs focused on coronavirus. So if you rely on government contracting, you, it's critical for you to find other ways to help you get a leg up in the competitive cycle um, and be seen. So the way that we recommend doing that, for those of you that don't have any certifications or don't have all of these, is to get certified. So there's really three major benefits that you can get out of being a certified business. So when you're a government contractor, you respond to requests for proposals and requests for quotes from government agencies in order to make your money. And being certified allows you to access one, special contracts that are only designed for certified companies or certain sole source contracts. Um, you get a point preference in some uh, bidding processes for some contracts. And uh, you can also be participate in set-asides that only have you compete against other certified companies. So what that means is your small business might have a leg up in competing on a contract where a much larger government contractor like Arup or URS Corporation would be able to outbid you, you might have a chance with that contract, you know, with being certified business. 
So as far as business spending, so it has been, uh, it declined massively during the COVID-19 outbreak, but actually business spending has been on the decline since way before that, back to early 2019. If you look at the GDP reports in the US, beginning in quarter two, 2019, business spending was declining significantly. So what is business spending? That's the investments in inventory and investments in expanding to facilities. So this most directly affects contractors, consultants, uh, uh, and equipment and fixture suppliers, basically anybody that's generating an asset for a business. Um, so budgets for, so these budgets have been contracting and specifically they're contracting for expansion. But I want you folks to remember that there are always opportunities to propose saving companies money. So if you're in one of these fields as a contractor, consultant, equipment, furniture, fixture supplier, there's a way that you could perhaps propose offerings to your clients that save them money as opposed to target you know, their ambitions to expand their business. So that could include things like energy efficiency, uh, being able to optimize your clients' financial operations in some way, be able to save them money on their jewelry, so meaning make their operation more efficient. Uh, being able to point out ways in which their business could be saving more money uh, with based upon the income that they're making right now. And also uh, think about bundling your services with other companies. So this might be a way to make your offering more palatable to businesses if it's bundled in with the cost of another component in the value chain for that uh, company. So if you make furniture or you make you know, fixtures for spaces, team up with a construction contractor and have your offering bundled into their pricing or have them do some of the selling for you, you know, be their exclusive provider. And specifically to consultancies, consultancies teaming up with contractors and lawyers um, puts you all in the same value chain. Now there's some restrictions that are associated with this, in particular with architects and engineers, but for everybody else, if you do it in the right way, you can figure out a way to propose unified offerings and perhaps offer cost savings to your clients. So that's about it. Um, I want to open this up for questions. Thank you so much, Alec. Um, as a reminder, everybody, if you'd like to submit a question, you can submit it in the questions tab on the GoToWebinar toolbar. Um, we'll stay on for the next 10 minutes or so to answer any questions you might have. You can also submit them in the chat if that's easier. We'll take a look there as well. Um, so please feel free to submit those now. You can also submit them via email um, after the presentation if you think of something that comes up afterwards. We will be sending out a recording of this presentation for you to revisit at a later time um, in the next couple of days. Um, I did notice somebody had their hand up. Oh, let's take a look here. Let's see, I see Pamela has her hand up. Pamela, I'll unmute you and if you want to, um, ask your question via audio, you can do that. Did you have a question, Pamela? Oh, we have a couple of other questions here, Alec, that came in. Um, so you may or may not know the answer to this. Um, do you know about any guidelines out there, Alec, for reopening spaces like an art studio in terms of um, what will be required. Um, any insights on that? I really don't. I'm sorry. Um, I wish I had more to offer there, but I don't. Okay. I'm not sure what the requirements from the government are. Um, I think they would probably come from New York State, if any agency. Yep. Yep. I would keep an eye on, um, you know, the guidance being issued by your locality or the state. 
Um, we have another question here, Alec. Um, can you give advice on retailers that work with vendors? Um, this person has a high-end clothing retail store and they want to ask for additional discounts or free freight from vendors, but they don't want to pressure them when the vendor themselves may be having their own issues. Do you have any advice for that situation? They want to ask for a discount from uh, their vendors, but don't want to pressure them since they might be having their own difficulties in the moment. Is that right? Correct. Yep. I would say that um, it's it's another option that you have is that you can propose to your vendor different payment terms. So if that vendor is having difficulties related to income on the whole, talk to them about perhaps spreading out your payment schedule with them. That's another alternative that you have at your disposal. Um, you can ask for discounts that might uh, go away after a certain specified point in time. Um, if they're having their own financial difficulties, it's going to be, ultimately, it's going to be hard to just ask to be able to pay less money right now. But um, th those are other options, like being able to change your payment schedule with them. Great, thank you. Um, it looks like we are all set with the questions. Um, so thank you again, Alec, for a great presentation. Um, thank you everybody for joining us today. Like I said, we will send out a recording for you to revisit at a laser, later date. Um, and please keep an eye on your inbox for additional webinars we'll be presenting in the future. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.